Welcome to the Arts and Oddities Podcast with A.M. Hall, starring A.M. Hall. Now, here is A.M. Hall. Welcome to Art and Oddities with A.M. Hall, where I talk about anything that strikes my fancy to include all kinds of creative works from children's cartoons to underground zines to identity politics and everything in between. My guests and I will discuss how art impacts and reflects culture and counterculture, enables individualism and conformity, and have loads of fun along the way. I am your host, A.M. Hall, a.k.a. Anthony Bonafini, a.k.a. Galena Storm, a.k.a. Aquaises Mancuso. This week, I'll talk about why perfect things are a pain in the butt. Then I talk with Mr. Tej66 of Mr. Tej's Movie Reviews about his role as the title character in The Trial of Hephaestus. We also reminisced about the days when movie credits were at the beginning. Shame on us, our credits are at the end. As an aside, if you enjoy listening to the podcast, please, please support my Patreon at patreon.com slash panicbedlam. That's P-A-N-I-K-B-E-D-L-A-M. Panic and I are looking to get some better quality microphones and make the entire podcast just sound all around better. But we can't do it without your help. I've mentioned in previous episodes that I have been, I have played the ukulele, and I believe I've mentioned in a previous episode that I haven't been playing as much as I'd really like to play, mostly due to the pain that I've been having in my hands, and especially in my thumbs. I haven't been having a problem with fretting the instrument, I'm having a huge problem with strumming the instrument. It's become a very difficult thing for me to properly hold the instrument and strum it. I haven't been playing as much as I'd like, but I've managed to find a workaround for this by utilizing thumb picks and finger picks. I haven't found a finger pick that I like just yet, but the thumb picks are working very well for me so far. I'm able to strum both up and down with a thumb pick. I understand that a lot of people are not able to do that. I can do it both ways. I'm finally starting to play a little bit more, and finally starting to improve my technique a little bit better. One of the th- the issues that I tend to run into whenever I start up a new hobby or I, whenever I try to do something new is that I try to do too much at once. Whenever I try to pick up the ukulele, I don't try to learn a simple song. I try to learn a complicated song because I want my playing to sound like a classical guitar. That's the type of music that I'd, I'd really like to to play. That's the type of music that I really like, things that are very pretty. When I sat down to play the ukulele, I wanted to know why I had to hold down these these particular strings at these particular frets in order to make an F chord. Why? What does that do? What are the notes? And even though these are the notes, why does that mean it's an F chord? Why does it do this? Why does it do that? I wanted to know music theory before I could properly strum my instrument. My taste exceeds my skill. And that's been a problem for me over the course of my life, is that I give things up because my taste exceeds my skill. But playing beautifully is not as important as playing. It's important that I just pick up the ukulele and play it for a few minutes a day, even if I'm playing the same song over and over, even if I'm all I'm doing is practicing my scales, that's still something. And it's important to do things. It's important to get over yourself. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the wrong kind of perfectionism. The kind that prevents me from actively doing the things that I want to do, rather than the kind that leads me to do the things I want to do and do them well. I know that anything worth doing is worth doing well. I have to repeat to myself, like a mantra, that anything worth doing is worth doing badly for a while. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. For a while. Until you get good at it. Because it's not about talent, it's about skill. And skill is something that comes with practice. Practice, practice, practice. You can get good at anything that you practice. There are some things and some people that have natural talent. There are lots of people who are naturally talented at one thing or another, but in the end, all of these people always reach a plateau. There is a plateau, because there's only so far that raw talent will take you. You can only skim by on raw talent for so long before your talent bumps up against the edge of your skill. People who work harder than the people with raw talent at developing their skill will eventually surpass these talented people. 
And every time someone says to me, oh, you're so talented, I don't I don't think of that as being a compliment. I always smile and say thank you, but in reality, I'm far more impressed with my skill, and I'm far more impressed with your skill. What is it that you're doing right now? Are you getting in your own way? I hope not. Making good art is not as important as making art. The highest form of magic is doing. Go out there and do things, and don't get in your own way. I would like to welcome back, friend of the show, Mr. Teej66 of Mr. Teej's Movie Reviews. How you doing today, Mr. Teej? Fantastic. It is great to be back here. It has been quite some time since I've had you on my show. I've... Yes, indeed. It hasn't been since, like, episode four that I've had you on. Which was a couple months ago. We've been doing this for a couple months. It's it has been, been quite some time, yeah. But you and I have been working hard. I know you've been working hard on your movie review channel. Yes, I have. Oh, absolutely. Just churning them out. Turning them out, and uh, you have also been working hard on our projects. You've been working hard on The Trial of Hephaestus. That's correct. Uh, I play Hephaestus. The title character. Yes, and also known as Vulcan, which I like better because... Vulcan Hephaestus. Vulcan being the Roman name for the yeah, Greek exactly, Hephaestus. because, you know, I'm a Star Trek fan, so it's like, I get to be a Vulcan, or Vulcan, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's kind of <laughs> funny to me, but anyway. Yeah, of course. And we just wrapped up filming all of your specific scenes for The Trial of Hephaestus. Your first scene was... With Nix Eradicatus, who plays the Muse Errato. That's correct. And I understand you know Nix Eradicatus pretty fairly well. Yeah, we've we worked at a restaurant establishment, let's just say, for several years together, and got to know each other. And after I left, I stayed in contact with her, and that's how I met you guys. So you know her very well. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like uh, working with her? I know your your characters had never met before. <laughs> Well, it's the first time I'd ever acted too, but with anybody. But I think she did. She did a pretty good job. Very slinky, very sexy. You know, I believe she's had some some theater training, which is more than you can say for me. So, you know, I was. There are times where I was just kind of like, oh, wow, okay. I don't know if she's had any theater training or not. Maybe she has. I th think she has, but I'll I'll be sure to ask her about it the next time I have her on my podcast. Exactly. <laughs> so your the second scene that you filmed was with. Robin Armstrong, who played Venus Aphrodite, your wife. Yes. And you had not really known her very well. You'd only met her like maybe once or twice beforehand. Yeah, I got the best of both worlds. Someone I know that I knew very well to act with, and then someone I had no idea whatsoever. But it was fun, you know. It's it's very th theatrical acting, so it's fine. She's, there's one part where she throws me on the bed where you know, <laughs> she she really threw me on the bed. I was just like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, she was definitely getting into it, very method, method acting. Exactly. But no, like, I'm, I'm curious, like, you are someone who has never really acted before, but, no. and no, the two people that you needed to act opposite of, the one character was played by someone you knew very well, but your characters didn't know each other, versus the other character you didn't know very well at all, and you were supposed to be married. Oh, I hadn't really thought of that, but yeah, you're correct, it's a little dichotomy there. Was that interesting at all for you? I mean, I, I have no context, I've never really acted before, so, okay. but, you know... It was fine for what it was. It was fun. You know, it's very theatrical acting anyway. It's not like, you know, subtle or anything like that. So that's it's fine. That probably helps quite a bit. Your character was very over the top. Oh, God. Yes, he was. And it was so much <laughs> fun to play. Uh, what was your favorite part of playing the role of Hephaestus? Oh, using my big uh, hammer. Uh, my big hammer? Hammer. Thank you very much. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, hammering that because I pretended I was Thor because I'm a comic book nerd. You know, and I like I like Mjolnir and stuff like that, so that was pretty fun, you know, hammering on my forge. Yeah. It was a blast. We put you through a workout that night. Oh, my God, my foot hurt so bad by the end because <laughs> you know, I worked eight and a half hours, you know, during the day, and I got to come over here and do that. But uh, as I said to you guys at the end of the night, I was like, man, I don't have to go to the gym tonight. Yeah, we did put you through Ooh. a number of things. I think it was definitely exacerbated, like, all the hard work you were doing and also the costume that you were wearing. Oh, Lord, that was not fun. <laughs> So the costume involved a very long wig made of yarn and a full face mask and yeah. you know, long sleeves, gloves, the works. You were pretty much covered from head to toe, and it was very hot, I understand. Um, yes. Oh, oh, God. 
every couple minutes I had to stop and, you know, so sweating my butt off. Ugh, it was not fun. We had to take some breaks and get you out of that costume just so you could cool yeah. down a bit and, well, like, get fine. you back five into minutes, it later. Five, ten minutes. I was, ready, I was ready to go again. It's important. You know, you no, we don't want anyone dying of heat stroke here I, for the I, sake I of like the a film. Muppet, basically. <laughs> we've, we've, I've been officially called the Muppet pretty much because yeah, I, I really do look <laughs> like one when people see it. are going to be like... No, it was. it's amazing. It's amazing. And, um, you know, as someone who, you exactly. know, created the majority of the costume... I'm really pleased with the way. You well, thank you very film. much. I, I I just needed some strings or something like that or whatever or like like a puppet <laughs> or something. And it was, I ain't got oh, no God. strings. Oh God! I was me. thinking down. <laughs> but anyway. All right. I can tell you're chomping at the bit to tell me a little bit about your favorite right. part. Favorite favorite part. My favorite part because I played I played another part in the film. You did tell me it about it. It was a cyclops where I get to just you know make lewd crude gestures towards her hermaphrodite. Well, I think it was yeah hermaphrodite. No, it was actually Arado, wasn't it? It was. Thank you, yes. It was. And then... And it was Hermaphrodite. Yeah, and plop, like... It plop, just yeah, like plops it's off. Like, <laughs> this is an audio thing, so I can't really show you, but it's like... I, I, I go, ah! You know, like that, as she brings her magic wand against me. Ma- making, like, very oh, large gestures at the camera. I understand now, people who say playing the villains is more fun, because it really is. You can just be as body and, you know, out there as you want, and you don't have to worry about subtlety. Someone's playing the good characters... A little more boring. Not that not not that Vulcan was boring, but that was just the more fun part where I can just you know let it rip. It may have been more fun because of the costume. This is true as well. It's just a mask which helped. It literally was just a paper mask, and well, your it was normal hard to clothes. See, so I, I was ready to. I, I was hope, thinking I was going to trip, and we're going to have some archive footage of me like going down like a sack of potatoes. Like, uh, <laughs> all, all oh, three of you collapsing like in a heap or something. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been pretty. <laughs> as far as uh, blooper oh footage goes, that would have been pretty rad. I'm glad. I'm glad it didn't yeah. happen though. We didn't want oh, any skin knees on the. Know, I can imagine on like, the, the show. sound effect. Oh. Beautiful. I almost wish it did. Almost. Not quite. Almost. Not quite. All right. <laughs> I tell you what I didn't like about that particular scene was the space we were in. We filmed oh, it in our basement. Oh, yeah. It was hot. I'm glad I didn't have to... I actually did have to film my scenes down... One of my scenes down there, and thankfully it wasn't too hot a day, so that probably helped immensely, but, like, the second scene, was a, we had to be under lights and stuff. Oh, that was that was baking. It was, it was pretty bad. So, and this is what actors go through every day. Aren't you oh, glad you're not God. an actor? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Never say never, you know. <laughs> Probably not. You though. are an actor. You're an actor in this film. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm an actor in real life, too. You have been there through thick and thin for us. You have been the crew, essentially, yes. for this film. You've been, you know, just a general stagehand, holding cue cards, just being available and ready whenever we needed you, providing rides. That's my, I think it's been my main story. Probably if I had to say any credit on the film, it would probably be transport coordinator or something Definitely, like that. you're definitely going to be getting a, a credit for that, because, you know, what you've done for us behind the scenes has been absolutely invaluable. I consider myself very lucky that I have a car, because a lot of people don't. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do not. I do not. And I and believe me, I know what it's like to have to not have a car. We're not that's a whole other story, but like I, That's I, not what we're talking about today, but you know, that's uh that's neither here nor there. We just want to thank you for being there and, and helping us out with all that. Yeah. All right. This film would not have gotten made without you. Aw, thanks. I try to help. But you know, the production of the film is actually almost over. We still have a handful of scenes left to film. I think there's only like three or four scenes left to film. Almost all of them are just exclusively me. Exactly, as the uh, satyr. I'm going to be playing the satyr, which is the uh, the narrator of the entire per- the entire story. Which, which is going to be very. There's some quirky pe- quirky characters in this film. I will say that. Yeah, it's that's that's what makes it a satire because it has a satyr in the film. Yeah, you know, there's some lines. I I won't give them away, but like. There's some funny lines in this movie there. Oh, yeah. Like, what the? Did that just happen? Evie's an absolute genius. Oh, my goodness. Evie's yes. a genius. But no, um, the production is almost over. We're going to be releasing some trailers soon. And anyone who is interested in finding out a little bit more about the story, we have an audio book of the script available on SoundCloud. We'll put a link in the show notes for that. And also, the script is available for sale. And I will put a link in the show notes for that as well. I've read that, actually. Of course you've read it. You were an actor in this. Well, yeah, the whole most of it. You know, I just, I I read a lot of my stuff and then, you know, glanced over it a little bit, you know. (laughs) 
<laughs> my head hurts after listening to too much like Shakespearean talk after a while. It's like, oh god, I gotta stop for a while. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway. Alright, so that's all of the stuff that we've been doing together on the film. Let me, let's me let talk a little bit about what you've been doing. I have been doing my movie reviews continuously, you know, just churning them out. Just one right after the other. I know I appeared in at least one of them. I... One was it one? Yeah, it was yeah. planet. It was one of the planet. It was the Beneath sequel to Planet, planet of, of the Apes. Apes yes. Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which you, which got quite a few uh, views actually. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Was it because of me? I don't uh, understand. Well, I think just more group, you know, more group videos just tend to get more attention than. The, Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's what e, that's what Evie told me. Pretty much, that, like group videos get more attention. It's it's good. So I was in one of your videos. You were. Who else have you been inviting to uh, be on your channel? Uh, Nicole was in one as, in one of my first Nix ones. Nix Eradicatus. That's true, I keep forgetting her name. Yeah, she's just Nicole to me, but uh, I still learned <laughs> to call her Nix. But yes, she was in one, and uh, Evie was actually in one as well, in that one as well. So it's only been the, the three of us who have been on your channel, exactly. besides but, you? Hey, I'm looking for anybody. Oh, wait, no, Monomac, too. He reviewed oh, yeah. the original Planet of the Apes. I, I almost forgot about that. That one got a lot of uh, hits, too. Well, yeah, Motomac has his own following. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, crossover. But, you know, I'm looking for anybody who just wants to come and review movies who are, you know, weird and hey, different. sit down, hang out, watch a watch a weird movie, then sit down and review exactly. it. Exactly. I, I try to watch everything, you know. I understand. Like, what was your latest one? It? Uh, yes, I went and saw Stephen King's It, which was utterly fantastic, you know. One of the best Stephen King adaptations. Uh, ho I'll say horror adaptations. I've ever seen. I've seen. I've 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 heard some good things about it. I gotta say, I am not a fan of horror at okay, all. So you wouldn't even <laughs> bother, you don't think, or uh, that's not a movie that I'm interested in seeing. But I do understand that lots of people love the horror genre, and it's something very cathartic for a lot of people. I know you you really love it. Nix really loves it. I, I like it a lot. You know, it depends. There has you know, there's a lot of bad horror movies where it's just you know very poorly made, and you know, they have to be good. I like a good horror movie like like it. Okay. It was very well made. It's very well acted. Professionally done, you know. It, it was gory, but not overly gory. How do you feel about horror movies that are so bad they're good? They can be guilty pleasures. Like, I love Friday the 13th. While also, all, you know, Nightmare... Well, the first Nightmare on Elm Street's pretty dang good. Um, you know, just low-budget splatter movies like, you know, Slumber Camp Massacre and stuff like that, where it's just impossible to take seriously. That's always fun. Yeah, I'm definitely planning on having someone on my show who, who used to make bad horror movies on purpose. Really? I am. So, um, but that's, uh, neither here nor there. That's going to be a future guest. Exactly. exactly. I want to keep the surprise of who it is. Of course. This person's, one of this person's main influences was actually Ed Wood. Ah. So. I have to admit, I've never seen any, any Ed Wood movies. Ed Wood, Ed Wood's movies are definitely movies that you kind of have on in the background while you're inebriated. <laughs> well, he only made, like, three really, like, actual, like, noteworthy ones, right? He he made that many noteworthy ones. Uh, Ed Wood, you know, definitely made a lot of... Plan 9, I know that. And Glenn and Glenda is the other one. I don't remember what the other And one. then there was the one that... Bride of the Monsters starring, uh, Tor Johnson. <laughs> and, um, he made a lot of films that never got any credit at all. He, like, he made a lot of pornos. I think I've heard that. I've watched Ed Wood, the, uh, documentary, of course, with, uh, with Johnny Depp, so... You know, I just review anything and everything, you know. You know, I know you've watched a lot of weird movies. We keep trying to show you American Astronaut. Yes, it, I, they, they have been trying to show me American Astronaut. I started to watch it and was like, I need to really, like, it seems like one of those movies where you have to really just tune everything out and just pay attention to the movie with no distractions. You know, it's hard for me to watch a movie in a group watch something I've never seen before in a group sometimes. Cause I really yeah, you kept to... interrupting us to ask questions, yeah. and it was like, oh my gosh, just just watch the film. All your questions will be answered. Another reason why I like isolation, where I can just... I've actually, I've actually talked to myself before during the movie, like, what? Like, you know, what? What's going on? Well, definitely, if you want a movie for your movie review channel, where Evie and I will appear, American Astronaut is definitely one that we would like to sit down and watch well, with you. I'm all for it. You know, anything to get views, I'm I won't say I'm desperate at this point, but... Oh, you know. You know it's getting frustr it, it, it gets frustrating sometimes when you get, like, two views. I mean, I don't expect it to be, like, 20,000, but, like... Every viewer is extremely valuable. Every one of my podcast listeners is so near and dear to my heart. I love each and every single one of them. And they're all very valuable. And it doesn't matter that you only have two viewers. If It doesn't matter if I only have 20 listeners. It doesn't matter. 
because I'm putting something out there that's important. You're putting something out there that's important. We're getting our voices heard. That was a, that was the subject of one of my videos. <laughs> well, I've been doing these videos called drunken videos. I'll just say it flat out. Yeah, I get a little inebriated. Not too bad, but enough for my tongue gets a little loose. Although Evie commented that like I, I wasn't acting that drunk, which I was kind of shocked by, but. But, you know, it's important that we are actually doing things. It doesn't really matter if we're having a huge impact on the larger culture, popular culture at large. It doesn't matter. We're doing things. We're putting stuff out there. We're making things that were not there before. Yes, yet. I, And I, that's what this whole whole thing is about. That's what I'm here to do other podcasts, to promote. That, yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to let you know, it doesn't matter. If you're only getting two views, it doesn't matter. I know. It's just... I'm only human. I get frustrated sometimes, but it's like, oh, come on. Years from now, people are going to look back on this as your early work. <laughs> Hopefully, if it, I mean, it, there's one thing in life where, where you, you know, you really want to get paid to do what you love, and that's not a luxury that a lot of people have. Tell me about your method. I understand you're just basically just recording on your phone and then just just uploading oh, yeah, it straight. As simple as it can possibly get. You know, I'm 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 planning on upgrading, which is important, but not until probably the new year when I get my tax return money back. Cause... No, I know, I understand a lot of people really like movie reviews where not only is the person talking about the movie, but there might be images of the film, of the scenes that are being sh being talked about, yeah, just kind of flashing yeah, across I the screen. I need to get something better before I can, I, I have a basic phone that doesn't need to do any of that, so it's a pain. So we're doing what we're doing with the equipment that we have. But, yes, in the future it is good to upgrade, and I am aware of that, and I'm gonna be trying but right now i just you know i gotta rely on my personality you know well you certainly do have an interesting and loud personality <laughs> Very loud. i guess i am yes on my videos i'm i put it very much out there you know i want to I, I, i'm trying to monetize and you know grow my audience and stuff like that so you know okay that is that is a very good counterpoint you need to have an audience in order to sell your audience whatever it is that you're selling yeah, and, you know it gets frustrating sometimes but you know i gotta keep at it and, I, and i'm actually have a facebook group as well okay tell us about that mr t 66's movie review movie discussion or i just you know i pop up stuff and all that makes you know that uh interest me like i i, I put one up today with uh how come there are no credit sequences in movies anymore at the beginning you mean the opening oh, sequence credits. it aggravates me so much because i remember as a kid you you know these kids they you know it they're, they're so impatient, you know, I am older. So. Have you ever seen, like, the opening credits for movies from, like, the 30s? There were no ending credits. Yeah. The only credits were at the beginning yeah, of the film. Yeah, there was, like, basic minimal. I, yeah, you're right, but the movies I grew up with had, like, you know, nice long, you know, five, you know, three to five minute credit sequences. But they just, you know, these people work so hard, you know, like, to put, you know, to put this on the screen. I think they should be given proper credit at the beginning. I just, you know, a lot of these movies today just, you know, they just start, and there's no credits, nothing, and it's kind of like... You know, I tell you what, this actually goes back to, to one of the things that I do whenever I go and see a movie in the theater, which is not very often, is I always sit through the entirety of the credits. It doesn't matter to me if there's going to be a cut scene at the end. That's not why I stay. I stay through the credits so that I read all of the credits. You know, I don't read every single name, that's impossible, but I always make sure to sit there and look at the screen and look at all these names and appreciate the fact that it took all of yeah. these people to make this I'm thing guilty. happen. I'm guilty, I don't sit through the credits. I sit through the beginning, I just, I, I guess I'm saying it's more of a stylistic thing as well as being, as being that, you know, opening credits, but, like, you think of, like, the Superman opening credits, you know, from from Richard Donner's Superman the movie, you know, those flashing credits that fly at the screen it's almost like 3d i mean with the john williams amazing music you know it just there's a rush to them i think and i'm probably over analyzing it but there's a rush to them which i love you know it, it gets you into the mood it gets you into the you know the style and tone of the movie i just i miss that m m movies now just start they do it's just they do just start one of the exceptions one of the notable exceptions that proves the rule being star wars I guess my favorite movie of all time isn't that ironic. And the new movies are kind of coming out right now as we're recording. You know, the episode seven and Rogue One have already been out for a while. Yes, and they have the same thing. Episode eight will be coming out later this year, and they're doing that thing where the classic Star Wars not credits, but like the the opening like exposition yeah, scrolling course. through. So there are exceptions, and I guess that is ironic. It's my favorite movie. Except, so. Exception that proves the rule, like I okay, said. Well, that's an artistic choice as much as anything else, though, but... Yeah, understandable. 
But anyway, go and check out Mr. Teach 66 on YouTube at Mr. Teach's Movie Reviews, and apparently also on Facebook at Mr. Teach 66's Movie Discussion. Exactly. You know, it's an open group. I Yeah, definitely. I will be definitely giving you a look. And thank you very much for coming back onto my podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Um, hopefully we work together, you know, and grow both of our things. Thanks for listening to the Art and Oddities podcast with A.M. Hall. That's our show for today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go through the grueling task of leaving us a review on whatever platform you're using to listen. I have a new and improved URL to the iTunes page. It's tiny.cc slash A.M. Hall. Or just Google Art and Oddities podcast for the player of your choice. The production of this podcast has been provided by Reverend Panic Evlan Bedlam, or Evie for short, and without her it would not exist. As stated in the show's intro, we're hoping to upgrade our microphones and other sound equipment. You can help us do that by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash panicbedlam, that's P-A-N-I-K-B-E-D-L-A-M. Evie has also done me the honor of designing some t-shirts for the podcast. Just search for Panic Bedlam on redbubble.com. Links to the Redbubble page and to pages where you can purchase Evie's books and tarot cards will be available in the show notes. Today's guest, Mr. Teach 66 can be found on YouTube. Just search his name there. There will also be a link to his channel in the show notes. Mentioned in the show was Nyx Eradicatus of Horror Cult Renaissance. There will also be a link to her channel in the show notes. Our theme music, Doxel Dance in Space Time, or Belial and His Seven Wives, was composed and performed by Kion Huru Orion, or as I know him, Michael. Thanks, Michael. If anyone is interested in finding out more about our film, The Trial of Hephaestus, you can go to the Trial of Hephaestus tab on panicbedlam.com. Or you can join our Facebook group, Trial of Hephaestus Movie. If you would like to contact the show with comments or suggestions, you can email us at artoddiesepodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook. Join our group at facebook.com slash groups slash oddartpodcast, all one word. Or on Twitter at twitter.com slash artoddiespod. Next week, I'll be joined by James A. Robertson of Jar Humor, and he'll tell us all whether he keeps his jokes in jars. That about wraps it up. Remember, the highest form of magic is doing, and expressing yourself is art. This is A.M. Hall, signing off.